These five editing techniques ruined me. I mean, here's me on this channel trying to brand myself as this mentor editor and showing you all of these editing and storytelling techniques. Great work. But secretly, I've wanted mentors myself because I know, I know that I still have so much more to learn. So for the past year and a half, I've invited a new mentor every single week into my home to teach me something that I don't know about editing. And... <laughs> I'm embarrassed. I have wasted so much time and creative energy, years of problems that would have been solved if I knew these earlier. And it's not just, oh, here's this keyboard shortcut. It's like advanced, deep stuff that I'm embarrassed I didn't know. And so here's a drink to grieve the time that I have lost. Time that I can give to you. Because I'm gonna tell you the five advanced editing and storytelling techniques that hurt me the most. So number one is, it's best to make the edit before you make the edit. Weird sentence, I know, but I can shed some light on this. The time comes in the video when you have to do a montage. And that normally comes into you going through the footage and sort of picking at random the clips that you choose. I mean, that is the go-to obvious way to start a montage. So much so that when I get client briefs, they normally just say montage. But a creator named Dodford challenges that idea. Would you welcome Jerry Seinfeld? Seinfeld. Yeah. One, the only, Jerry Seinfeld! I used to just write montage. I used to put it in brackets, like, I'll make a montage here. We will have these sound bites as blue hyperlinks, and I'll write as if I'm writing an essay. I was disappointed in you for quitting piano. And then we, we talked to Noah, and he uh, was thinking a similar thought. But just seeing a montage written out like this, I've never seen anything like this before. It's what came naturally to me. I think this is how I like to visualize it. You don't just say montage. You have to have an intent and know what that montage is and write it. And so now when I work on montages, I write out beat for beat what you want in the edit, putting it into words first. It can be on a script or even as a text storyboard on your timeline. It's like adding pre-production to your post-production. And so when I say make the edit before you make the edit, what I really mean is write the edit before you make the edit. And then here is number two. When we brought in the editor of HBO's The Last of Us, which by the way was the best television of 2023, come at me bro, he introduced to me the idea of how to start editing an action sequence. <laughs> It was a massive sequence. And normally, like, a sequence like this is, like, physical action. And there's a lot of moving parts, and there's all sorts of uh, things happening. You know, I don't necessarily want this to be just physical action. I want this to be character-based action. I want the, the character of Joel and the character of Ellie to be the forefront of the uh, viewer's mind. How does this all affect Joel? How does this affect Ellie? We did in the edit was we actually isolated all of those moments between Joel and Ellie and made sure that we were telling it directly from their perspective. And Joel being in that sniper's nest, he can't do anything except fire. <laughs> I mean, the action's kind of the secondary priority in this. In a way, yes. Yeah, that's obvious. Character action, of course. But the number of times that I've gotten just into the spectacle of the edit, basically only just highlighting the action. I have forgotten that the action is meant to serve the character and the story. Because when we met the editor of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, he explained how he made an action sequence also have character action. When it's first boarded and it's a lot of cool action, it was a lot of chase, 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 fight, fight, fight. The thing you realize is, okay, that's all very cool, but we're lacking character. Why don't we take some of this dialogue on top of the train? You're an anomaly! If you let me go home, everywhere you go, you're an anomaly! We brought these down from on top of the train and mixed them into this battle and lay it through the rest of the scene. You're an anomaly! Anomaly. We mentioned how action can just turn into an action sequence yeah. and it kind of just helps this entire action sequence be character motivated. And the moments where Miles' heroic glory are always fulfilling. Yeah. Don't just cut action. Don't focus on the spectacle. Instead, focus on the character. Put the action in their perspective to service the story. Mm. And the next point, a web creator that I've been really enjoying these past two years is Kelly Wakasa. His videos are the encapsulation of vlogs, not just being vlogs anymore, but instead 
full-on documentary. And I am jealous of that skill, by the way. When I was cutting vlogs, it was essentially just cutting out all of the boring bits and making it a little bit faster. Yeah! yeah. It feels like a, like a fish in a fish tank. Oh. And now look what they're doing in the vlogs. I wasn't nervous. I was excited. That's a vlog now? It's fucking awesome. This is so well made that I... I, I, I wanted to know how they made it. So I invited Kelly and his editor Wyatt onto the show. But even though that I was intimidated by their skill, I asked them something that I thought was intentional. That was actually accidental. I'm getting a lot of uh, eye tracing here. It's interesting how much stays in the exact same center. The world's tallest man. I saw him for the first time when I was 10 years old. In the See, Guinness so much is still in the middle. And I found page 73. Where I laid it my must be a little subconscious. I really do enjoy like very symmetrical frame shots, sort of yeah. uh, like Wes Anderson type. Yes. So maybe it is subconscious that I try to do that kind of stuff. If the key piece of information is over here in the shot, I need to remember that because on the next cut, I know that's where they'll last be looking. And so I need to make sure that the next key information is easily found to maintain a smooth edit. That's something that I actively do. Wyatt does it instinctively. Do you have any idea how jealous that makes me? He can make a smooth edit without thinking about it. I mean, come on! But that's not all. Wyatt's music choices are on point. In your body, I'm, your the moment, cause do fast. I mean, they're cool and they're awesome, but the mainstream tracks. I mean, using mainstream tracks in a YouTube video, that's automatic demonetization. I mean, well, that's an assumption. Licked is the music platform that gives creators access to the world's biggest artists. You could be a creator with millions of subscribers or you're just starting. Licked gives you access to mainstream music that you can license in your video. They have a bloody massive library, like over 1 million mainstream songs. I didn't know there was that many mainstream songs. The library is so huge that you can license this track. She shake it like jelly. Damn. Damn. Honey, Damn. Damn. Or you could even license this one. You know I love you so. You could be really cheeky in your video and use one of my favorite songs of 2023. I'm just kidding. I've always wanted to use soundtracks and mainstream music in my content. Licensing that song through Licked means you get to keep your ad revenue and maintain your discoverability while having a needle drop track that could be key for retention. Go take a peek in Licked with the link in my description where you will also get 14 days free off their stock music and 50% off your first mainstream track. All right, well, this next point, this broke my soul. And it is about creativity on YouTube. The entire time that I've been on YouTube, I've inherently treated this as a creative platform. But as a platform has been developing, the industry has had to mature. And that maturity comes with making sure that what you're doing is sustainable. Therefore, sustainability actually means can I make sure that my videos are seen by as many people as possible? Because that's what pays for everything. And therein lies a core issue that I have. There was a video that I edited for Mr. Beast. In this video, we're curing a thousand people's blindness. <laughs> it's gonna be crazy. This video was so fun to make. And I put in all of my creativity into this. And when I showed it to Jimmy, there was a few things that he really liked. And there was quite a lot that he didn't. Something that he was right on. I went too arty. I wanted the first 20 seconds of the video to be completely blurry. Yeah! Can you watch a video like this? 200 million people see the world like this. But I just made it one less. Oh. Oh. Wow. That's really bright, but... <laughs> she is one of 200 people who came in today who suffer from blindness. And we're gonna cure all of them. And 800 more around the world. In this video, we're curing a thousand people's blindness. <laughs> it's gonna be crazy. I made on a Mr. Beast channel a sort of like art house film, which is cool, but it's not what Mr. Beast. At the end of the day, I was hired to do a job, but I didn't enjoy the feedback that I was given. And I held on to that sort of resentment for quite a while until I had a conversation with Dan Mace. Yeah. 
on it. Dan Mace is currently the chief creative officer of Beast Philanthropy. Whatever we upload, I'm fully leaning on him. And he is a phenomenal filmmaker. And I went into this interview kind of ready to express my resentment towards him. And I think he knew because he said something fascinating. In the original cut, because of how much work this is, mm -hmm. this was like 20 seconds long and Jimmy was like, cut it down. Mm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, people don't, like you guys would care. Yeah, you editors we care. And stuff, but the viewer doesn't really care as much. So it's a sad truth, you know, like us as filmmakers, we want it to be like the best thing that we can. We want to show as much as we can, but the viewers don't care about our effort as much as we do. Yeah, it's all about abandonment. Bro. Yeah. How much of your creativity are you willing to abandon to get more views? How much of your creativity are you willing to abandon for more views? What an interesting sentence. A lot of what we're doing in film, TV, and web media is also made to run a business. And running a business also has responsibilities. Therefore, you have to make sure that the video that you make can be as general as possible. And general audiences might not be that interested in your arty expression. Also, that has the other issue. A lot of creators go full on practical, essentially optimizing their video for as many people as possible. Those videos, don't they feel kind of soulless? And you can't describe what it is exactly, but there's just something missing. And the thing that is missing is the art. But artful content might not be as accessible for general audiences, but it doesn't mean that an audience isn't there. If you choose to be arty, you have to understand that that makes your video for specific audiences. And there might not be that many of them, but you're giving those arty audiences a much better time than you probably would give general audiences. And so there is the value. Who are you making your video for? If I am working on videos that are intended for general audiences, me as an editor need to have a discipline in finding that balance where I can be an artist, but also still make it practical enough for general audiences to be engaged in it. It's a really hard balance. How can I make sure that the video I make is accessible to as many people as possible and kind of sneak in the arty element. The perfect video is one that has both practical applications into optimizing your video and still maintaining an artful creative expression of you. So I'm gonna follow in those footsteps. How can I be an artist while also be a practical storyteller? Subscribe to the Editing Podcast and I'll see you later.